Over a period of 14 days in March 1988, a sequence of extraordinary events convulsed Northern Ireland and shocked the world. The bomb itself was apparently to have been detonated during a military... Survey. 14 days that left dozens of people injured and 12 people dead. People's fuses blew. Our, our judgment went. Nothing had really quite prepared you for this. Nothing had left so many mysteries and unanswered questions in the wake. Last week, two more died. The so-called Troubles had already raged for almost 20 years. There had been many deaths, many tragedies. Police say the victim had been shot a number of times in the head, body and legs. Three mourners were killed and 54 injured in a gun and grenade attack on the funeral. But as the latest shocking images played out on television screens around the world, Northern Ireland appeared to be on the edge of a horrifying abyss. Two soldiers were shot dead today at an IRA funeral in Belfast. People genuinely felt that we were on the cusp of something awful, that there was no telling where this could all end up. Writing which began this yesterday afternoon. As a witness to this horrific cycle of violence, one man, a redemptorist priest in Belfast, looked for hope, for light in the darkness that was descending over Northern Ireland. He did so as he administered the last rites to a dying man. His incentive, his inspiration always lay in his own mind turning towards what would Christ have done. But in many ways he was a visionary. He was the one who saw the first crocus of the spring. The church has a tendency to confine itself to liturgy, which is the easy way out, you see. You're not getting involved with the dirt. You're not dirtying your hands, you see, by getting involved in the actual situation and doing something about it. I used to say, I represent the next person who's going to be killed in this trouble. That was the line I took, that I don't belong to any political party. The only interest I have in, in this thing is the interest of the next victim. A member of the Redemptorist Order for over 60 years, Father Alec Reed was still in his 20s when he first came north to Belfast in the early 1960s. I was 17 going on 18 when I joined the Redemptorists. In those days, the idea was that if you wanted to do the best thing possible with your life, you should become a priest. Clonard Monastery, close to the Falls Road in West Belfast, is home to the city's Redemptorists. Missionaries who take the simple vows of poverty, chastity, obedience, and an oath to live among their congregation for the whole of their lives. The Redemptors always took a special interest in the people who are most abandoned, spiritually abandoned or economically abandoned, the poor of the world. Clonard is deeply rooted in West Belfast. It's a place, a sort of a sanctuary. There are many parish churches which people also love, but they have a sort of dual connection. And many of them come to Clonard because there is this very special atmosphere there. Clonard was one of the first focuses of the Troubles. It was right on what became the Peace Line right between the heart of the falls and the heart of the Shankar. Scores of houses were burnt out, out there, people were shot on the streets, there was hand-to-hand -hand fighting. So it's where, if you like, the troubles broke out. The small hours of August the 15th was a light. But now it was an open clash between Protestant and Roman Catholic and there was no attempt to disguise it. Four people shot dead in Belfast, including a nine-year-old boy sheltering in his own home. By going out on the streets, you try to find out why they were rioting, 
and then you try to get some other way of, of settling the thing. Over the next 20 years, the divisions in Northern Ireland widened. The violence intensified. By the late 1980s, Alec Reid, already experienced as an intermediary, was looking for a way forward, for a way to persuade the IRA to end its campaign. So many people were being killed, tensions were so high, polarization was almost complete back then. And you had people, especially among Catholic priests and especially Father Reid, saying, look, there must be a middle way through here, there must be some kind of compromise thing because this is tearing society apart. In a district where death threats and kneecappings are a gruesome fact of life, Father Reid has to find a non-violent way out. The fact that he lived the gospel, he, he, here he was from Tipperary, ends up in the streets of West Belfast in the middle of a war. So what was he to do? So he, he said, well, what would Jesus have done? I spoke to Father Alec maybe about a week or two after coming here, you know, because when I came here, I mean, I came with a concern as a redemptress to be able to do something, make some little contribution. So in a long conversation with Alec, uh, he said to me when I asked him, what can we do about the violence? He said, the only thing that will resolve it is the dialogue. Information about how the eight terrorists were actually killed is far from clear. What is known is that for several minutes, the area around the station was alive with bullets. While conversations about peace were beginning, the violence was continuing. In May 1987, the British Army ambushed and killed eight members of the Provisional IRA as they launched an attack on a police station in Loch Gall, County Armagh. A civilian passerby was also killed. Six months later, an IRA bomb exploded at the Inniskillen War Memorial as people gathered for a Remembrance Day service. Ten civilians and one off-duty police officer lost their lives, and in the outcry that followed, the IRA suffered a disastrous setback. Inniskillen clearly hurt and offended the psychology of the, of the Republican family. I think that many people in the Republican movement at that point in time questioned the capacity to continue because of what they, sh what they clearly saw as the immorality of Enniskillen. That year alone, the Troubles claimed the lives of 106 people. And as the death toll mounted, so too did the pressure and the desire among communities to find an end to the violence. By 1987, we'd had 18 years of violence. And there were phrases like uh, acceptable levels of violence. There were those of us who felt that no violence could ever be acceptable and that we had to find another way. There was conversation. And of course, Clonard was very much a center for uh, people uh, to come together to meet. The community at Clonard, of course, had played a very central role in encouraging uh, that kind of engagement. Well, Father Reed was a very, very quiet man. I normally saw him hanging on to a cigarette in the garden. He was a powerful smoker, you know, but he always, when he was smoking, he was doing his ruminating and thinking, you know. I was very conscious that he was living a quiet life and probably I sensed he was involved in things that I wasn't yet ready to step into, but that he was taking very seriously the conflict and was active in trying to promote some kind of dialogue. For Alec Reid, the political stalemate was being paid for with people's lives and couldn't be allowed to continue. My thinking always was that we'd have to stop the IRA because we get nowhere while the IRA are active because nobody will talk, unionists won't talk, 
even nationalists won't talk to Sinn Féin. And, and it had to be a dialogue between everybody. So to get that dialogue going, you had to persuade the IRA to stop. Jerry Adams told me that there was only one way to stop the IRA, and that was to get a peaceful strategy, which would be common to Sinn Féin, the SDLP, and the Irish government. The stakes in such a strategy were high and required John Hume, the leader of the nationalist SDLP, to cross a profoundly difficult political line. The thing was, first of all, to persuade John Hume, if he were prepared to talk to Gerry Adams, he would enable Gerry Adams then to talk to the IRA in a way that could at least persuade them to stop. I remember Father Alex at one point saying, I think, I think I'll get in touch with John Hume. So uh, he did so, and in fairness to John, uh, within about two days of receiving the letter, he was in Clannard Monastery, and we met. All constitutional politicians, all peaceful politicians, had huge reservations about meeting anybody on the paramilitary side, on the IRA side, on Sinn Féin. Those guys back then were just pariahs. But Hume stepped outside that and taking a gigantic risks, he went and did it. There was a series of meetings between John and Gerry Adams, you, you know, with uh, Father Reid very much uh, involved. And I suppose there were the openings of uh, exchanges and uh, ideas there. They decided that they would exchange papers, you see. John, John Hume was a great man for putting it down on paper. What was the, his, the position of his party? And he asked Jerry, would he put down the Sinn Féin position? That was Sinn Féin's position on solving the conflict in a democratic way. Finally, the two parties agreed to the start of a formal dialogue in January 1988. But the beginning of talks did not mean an end to the violence. After the serious setbacks of 1987, the IRS certainly felt it needed to deliver a, a spectacular blow to restore its, its prestige, to, to get a grip again, to, in, in fact, to, to acquire the momentum that it would have lost in '87. And while I was in prison at the time, I, I have no doubt that those would have been the, the factors that would have been pertinent in the decision to strike uh, at a spectacular target. This was to be the launch of the Semtex War. This was to be the next phase of the IRA campaign. 88 building to 89 and the 20th anniversary of British troops arriving here. The targets were military. Uh, the IRA didn't want to go to places where, uh, where, where there was the potential of killing civilians. They wanted to kill soldiers. They wanted to make a point. The place the IRA chose to make their point was Gibraltar, the British territory on the southern tip of Spain and once a strategic location for its military personnel. It looks very much as though the IRA was planning a major attack on a British Army band which traditionally marched through Gibraltar. What happened instead of that was that the IRA people were obviously being tailed, very careful surveillance, and the first thing anybody knew about this whenever the gunfire started and three IRA lay dead on the ground. Eyewitnesses said that there were several shots. One of the men and the woman were killed on the spot. The, second man the three IRA members who lay dead in Gibraltar had all strong connections to West Belfast. Maria Farrell, Sean Savage and Dan McCann was the third one, I think. Sean Savage had been um, an altar boy with us. He was a quiet, very quiet young man, you know. I knew Mary Ed Farrell's mother. They had a shop, a drapery shop there, not far away from Clonard. And I met Mary Ed as well. Dan McCann. Well, Dan McCann, I think he was our butcher. He certainly was the local butcher. I don't know if we dealt with him or not. So there were three kind of locals, in a sense. The Foreign Secretary this afternoon told the House of Commons that the three members of the IRA who were ambushed in Gibraltar were not in the act of planting a bomb. Controversy quickly surrounded the killings. 
with claims that the British Army had operated a shoot-to-kill policy. Eventually, the European Court of Human Rights ruled against the British government, stating that while the IRA members were engaged in an act of terrorism, they were unarmed and excessive force had been used against them. To hear that people had been shot in cold blood, you know, that was a very shocking thing, you know. You'd be very angry, because you'd think, why didn't they arrest them? They could have been arrested, but they were shot dead to send a message to the IRA that if that's the game you want to play, these are the rules. It was about delivering a message into the face of the IRA. An operation at that level could only have been compromised at a very, very senior level. And that in itself was a, a very, very startling shock. As much a shock as the fact that we knew the personnel who had been assassinated. Maureen Farrell, the woman who died, was, you might call her a star in Republican terms. She had been involved in a, a, a very long-running prison protest. And in a way that added to the to the shock, because one of the one of the stars of the Republican movements, one of the real heroine, was among the dead. The day after the killings, Spanish police discovered the IRA unit's car in an underground car park in Marbella. Inside were the components for a bomb. Journalists were told by local police that the device contained 132 pounds of Czech-made Semtex explosive for greater destructive effect. Amid rising tensions and the growing controversy, the bodies of the three IRA members lay in the Royal Navy morgue in Gibraltar. Last night, Moraine Farrell's brother Terence arrived in Gibraltar together with Joe Austin, a leading member of Sinn Féin. Then there was a very sort of torturous week trying to get the remains back home. Joe Austin and Moraine's brother travelled to Gibraltar and identified the bodies and travelled back. I knew the three of them, and therefore I went down to Dublin. That's my... I followed them. Just behind the house, I drove up to Belfast. I remember there was tremendous support and sympathy being shown by Republicans, both North and South, when the uh, coffins arrived back in Ireland. It turned into a major Republican commemoration, not just a funeral, but, but uh, something far bigger than that. I think from within the Protestant Unionist community, there was puzzlement. Here were three young people who had tragically become involved in a violent movement and whose intentions uh, had been thwarted in terms of the, uh, the bomb that was apparently intended to go off um, and kill many people. Why should there be such a huge wave of emotion? That was something that people within the Protestant Unionist loyalist community but you would find difficult to cope with. I recall very vividly the evening that uh, those coffins uh, were retrieved from Dublin. The atmosphere was very, very poisoned. I uh, recall that evening, hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands and thousands of people all awaiting the arrival uh, of, of the corpses and the bad blood which obtained. There was such bad blood over that. The RUC tried to separate the hearses from the cortege. They failed to do so up until uh, about two miles outside. Belfast, where they totally closed down, shut down the M1. The shooting happened shortly before 8 o'clock. On the night the coffins arrived back in Belfast, another IRA member, Kevin McCracken, 
was shot dead by a British soldier as he prepared to attack an army patrol. A high-powered rifle was found at the scene of the shooting, which took place close to the home of Sean Savage, one of the three IRA members shot dead in Gibraltar. The murder victim had arrived at Dunn's stores on the Annadale of... In South Belfast, loyalist gunmen claimed another victim as they shot dead Charles McGrillan, a Catholic supermarket worker and shop steward with no connections to any paramilitary organisation. Another death soon followed. Kevin Mulligan, a Catholic civilian shot by loyalist paramilitaries seven months earlier, finally succumbed to his injuries. As he did so, Belfast braced itself for the funerals of the three IRA members killed in Gibraltar. Policing of IRA funerals had been for a long time quite a controversial issue and one that was creating a, a considerable amount of anger within the Republican community. I would have covered a number of IRA funerals. At those funerals you couldn't move for the number of uh, police officers there. So there was always this standoff and tension uh, on that stage and in those circumstances between Republicans and the police. This argument about you, you won't even let us bury our dead. As the world's media looked on, what few people knew was that following negotiations between the police and Catholic Church leaders, the security forces had agreed to withdraw from these funerals. The police were in very close touch with Catholic bishops and, and influential priests and so on, who were saying to them, uh, pull back, pull the, pull the troops and the police back. And they did. Reporters were saying, and Republicans were saying, where are they? Where are the troops? Where are the police? Because they'd just about all vanished. They were obviously on the fringes of things, but the, the old days when they were lining the, the, the coffin on either side in, in ranks, that is all gone. And it was just a, a question of some, something new has happened. There's, there's a whole new policy. The funerals of the three IRA terrorists who were shot dead in Gibraltar 10 days ago are taking place in West Belfast. But the security forces have stayed at a distance from the cortege and members of Sinn Féin, the IRA's political wing, appeal to the mourners to stay calm. I went to the mouth of Milton Cemetery and I made my way down through the cemetery as these absolute waves of people moved. Like, it was like mass movement down through the graveyard. Journalists and camera crews and so on were gathered around the gravesides along with uh, leaders like Jerry Adams and so on. And there were thousands of people around. You could hardly see the end of the crowd. It just stretched off into the distance. The photographers all got headed into the very corner, so I split from the group in the corner and walked along the front of, of the roped area and up the hill to a high point, probably the highest point in the cemetery. There's a great Celtic cross up there. I was just standing there, and I can remember them starting to lower it. It was an awful atmosphere of, I suppose you'd call it, sadness, really. You know, shock. You had a sense of this, this whole thing is a tragedy, you know. We were lowering a coffin into the grave, and I, I, I think it may have been Dan McCann's. And th there was a loud, very dull thump. Stunned by the sudden attack, some of the crowd ran in all directions. Those around the graveside got down on the ground as instructed, others strained to see what was happening. Many of the crowd gave chase in hot pursuit of the man who stopped, turned and threw another grenade. I can 
see this man and he was shooting and throwing hand grenades as far as I could see. All hell broke loose and I didn't know what, what was, I couldn't see what was happening. People were lying about and I couldn't see exactly what was happening. Grenades were going off and uh, I saw this man with a pistol in his hand and turning and shooting back. There was a point where he levelled the gun at me because I was at this high point and of course I had what must have appeared to him to be a gun which was a 300 mil lens. This guy by this stage was loosing off, firing shots. Adams was on his feet, everybody was down. Adams was appealing to the young people to stay calm. Young people, young people, stay calm. I remember taking the microphone and appealing for calm. And from my slight vantage point, I could see because there were other explosions. You could see from where I was, but people were squealing, there were people injured, but you could see a little posse of mourners following this figure, and every so often the figure would turn and shoot. I remember thinking to myself, if he shot at you from there, would it kill you, would the bullet kill you? Jerry Adams was standing beside me. He started to back out of the cemetery, but he still had his gun. But these young lads went, went after him. And I was standing beside Jerry Adams, and I said to Jerry, if those young lads get their hands on him, they're going to pull Terry into pieces. They'll, you know, they'll stamp on him and kill him. And I said, I'm going to go down and see if I can stop that. And he said to me, are you mad? There were quite a few hundred people, young men, running after him, running towards this figure. As far as I know, none of them were armed, but he was there with his hand grenades and his guns, shooting and clearly hitting and wounding and, and killing people. Tons of people, I mean, of all ages, were had blood streaming from them, were being carted off, were being put into cars, were being ferried to the hospital. So it was a bit, it was a bit, uh, a bit mad. Taxis were pressed into service as makeshift ambulances until more of the real things arrived. The driver of the funeral car jumped up to me and he said, there's a man shot. He said, will you come down with us to the hospital? So I got into the passenger seat and there was a nurse in the back street and she was trying to help this man who was shot. And he died on the way down because I could hear the nurse kind of, she was trying to keep him going. And I could hear her sighing or making some kind of a, a sighing um, noise. And I realized that he had died. He died in the car on the way down. We went into the hospital then and three people had been shot. And I anointed the three of them. And, but they had died, you know. The wife of one of them came in, and I was standing with her when they came along and said her husband was dead, and I could, I, you know, she just collapsed inside. But it was difficult enough, you know, you put your arms around a woman. She wasn't that old, this woman. She was maybe in her 30s. And you could feel her, I could feel her breaking up when she was told her husband was dead, you know. Good evening. Three mourners were killed and 54 injured in a gun and grenade attack on the funeral of the IRA squad shot dead in Gibraltar 10 days ago. A gunman was chased, caught and beaten up by the crowd before being arrested. The three people killed in the attack were Thomas Mackerlane, John Murray, and Kevin Brady, a member of the IRA. Following his arrest, the attacker was named as loyalist Michael Stone. It was such a public performance, and I think that's what it was from Stone, uh, now that we know a bit more about him. It was a performance. 
it was not only something that he wanted to do, but something that he wanted to be seen doing. Stone claimed that it looks to be the case that he was after Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness. He would have known that with this funeral you were bound to get Adams and you were bound to get almost every senior Republican there. So it made sense to think that he would say, if I want to kill Jerry Adams and if I want to kill Republicans, that funeral is the place where I should be. I have been shot and there are a number of reported attempts to, to kill me. Uh, it goes with the territory, or it went with the territory, and that's where we were. Thankfully, all of us are in a better place. We can't bring back the people who have been killed, or we can't heal the people who were uh, injured. But uh, we were we were lucky to to survive. There was sporadic trouble in Belfast for about nine hours. Petrol Michael Stone's attack on the IRA funerals had been a dramatic and devastating turn in the cycle of violence. Northern Ireland, it seemed, was drifting into anarchy. The poison which filled the air was unimaginable at that point in time. The fear that filled the air, the suspicion about uh, how this guy penetrated the graveyard, did what he did, the questions about his capacity, did he have assistance? All of those things. Sinn Féin held a press conference afterwards, uh, headed by Gerry Adams, and he raised all sorts of questions. He said, what was going on here? And of course, the Sinn Féin line then was to suggest there were all sorts of conspiracies and hidden hands and hidden agendas going on behind these things. Those involved must have had pre-notice there would be no RUC, our British Army presence. Just hours after the incident, the script was about questions rather than having answers. What was that security operation about? Why was it so different? And of course, the conspiracy theorists and those who will, who will think the worst uh, will, will forever believe that a passage was cleared for Stone to walk into that, uh, that situation. I'm not saying that's what I believe, but that will be in the minds and in the heads of, of, of people. The police tonight called the collusion claim an outright lie. They said they'd kept a low profile today because the Catholic Church believed there'd be no trouble. Now the police face another IRA funeral tomorrow, St. Patrick's Day. They won't be welcome, but can they afford to stay away? The Milltown Cemetery in Belfast is again the focal point of Republican interest today. A patrol of soldiers moved through the gravestones hours before the funeral cortege for IRA man Kevin McCracken was due to arrive. With fear now gripping the whole of Northern Ireland, another shooting was claimed by the IRA one which turned out to be a case of mistaken identity. Near the border in County Fermanagh, detectives are investigating the murder of a Protestant woman outside her farmhouse. Gillian Johnston, who was 21, died as gunmen opened fire when she drove into the farmyard. The whole atmosphere was poisoned. The tension was rising. Nobody knew where anything was going. There was almost a sense that there was a potential somewhere for even worse. And worse was to come. The church has a tendency to confine itself to liturgy, you know? and preaching and that, which is the easy way out, you see, you can do that. But you're not getting involved with the dirt, you're not dirtying your hands, you see, by getting involved in the actual situation and doing something about it. I think it's the role of the church to try and stop people, to end situations where people are suffering. 
the church has a, a, a moral obligation to get involved and to get stuck into it and get into it and stop it. Alec always talked about you meet God in the midst of the troubles. He didn't build any walls to protect him feeling the pain of people. He was at funerals, he was in hospitals, he was with parents whose children had got involved. The troubles got to him, and his eyes never left the need for the violence to end. But another funeral loomed, as IRA member Kevin Brady was to be buried in Milltown Cemetery, where he'd been killed three days earlier. Once again, Alec Reed would be in attendance and focused on his secret peace initiative. The result of the meeting between Jerry Adams and John Hume was that John Hume suggested that both sides put their position, their political position on settling the conflict on paper. It was this document that Alec Reed was planning to collect from Sinn Féin at Kevin Brady's funeral and to deliver to John Hume. I got the document from Sinn Féin when the funeral was coming out, and I got the document, and I put it under my arm. And then I went down to say, to sympathize with Kevin Brady's mother. She was actually, which is a bit unusual, because the women usually didn't walk in, you know, they usually went in the morning cars, but she was actually walking beside the hearse. We passed St. Agnes's Church and Casement Park as to, to our right. I remember being quite relaxed in myself and being fairly glad that we'd got this bar without incident. And then out of my left eye, uh, I saw a, a movement and, and heard the sound of a, a car at speed and screeching of brakes. He got caught with the taxis that were acting as, as guard of honor. Inside the car, in civilian clothing, were two British army corporals, and they had driven into the path of the funeral cortege. Confusion reigned as they were quickly surrounded by mourners. Then the mourners were clearly frightened by something. One of the soldiers in the car had a gun. A crowd of mourners attacked the car, and I, uh, I heard someone shouting, he's got a gun. Everybody who was there lived with the memory of what had happened in the graveyard days earlier, and now gunmen in their midst. So you can imagine the panic and the fear that obtained. Everybody thought immediately, you see, this was another loyalist attack. One man got a brace, a wheel brace, out of one of the taxis, and he smashed the, wind, the windscreen. As some of the crowd attacked the car, one of the soldiers inside pulled out a gun and fired one shot. And then they pulled these two people out. And I went over to the driver's side. And I knew, when I was going around to the driver's side, I saw the passenger, and I knew by the, he looked bewildered. And I went around to the driver's side to get the driver, and they were kicking this man on the ground. By this time, they'd got the two, the two of them, the two, the two people, the passenger and the driver, and they were pushing him along to, into the side, pushing both of them into Casement Park. They brought him into Casement Park, put the two of them lying on their face down on the ground, and I got down between the two of them on my, you know, on my face, and I had my arm around it. I was holding. I had my arm around this one, and I was holding this one on by the shoulder. They were so disciplined. Now, there wasn't them. They just lay there totally still. And I decided then to myself, these must be soldiers. There was a helicopter circling overhead, 
And I don't know why they didn't do something. Why they didn't radio to the police or the soldiers to come up. Because there, there were these two of their own soldiers. When I was lying between the two soldiers, I remember saying to myself, this shouldn't be happening in a, in a civilised society. That motivated me or encouraged me to keep trying to kind of get away from this kind of a society where this kind of thing could happen. So I kept asking for an ambulance. As I was going, I was getting up and saying, will somebody get an ambulance? And I was lying there, next thing somebody came in and picked me up and said, he said, get up or I'll fucking well shoot you as well. And then he said, take him away, and they kind of arrested me. Two of them came on either shoulder and kind of maneuvered me out. But then when I got out, I came, got around and came back. And I can remember the atmosphere now, I can still remember that, but when I came back in, you could feel it. I knew they were going to be shot. It was a, it was a terrible, tense atmosphere. You know, I can remember standing there and thinking that they're going to shoot these from the actual feel, the feel you got. I remember saying to myself, well, I, I, I'm going to try and stop them doing that if I can, you know? And the next thing I realised that they had put them over a, a, a low wall inside Casement Park, which went down into a side street. My car was on a, an avenue just beside where we were in Casement Park, and I went out to, I said I'd get the car and I'd follow them. So I was just getting, opening the door of the car and I heard two shots. And at first I said, geez, the loyalists are attacking the funeral again. That was my first thought. I went to walk up to see what was happening. And I saw people looking up, the, 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 what they call an entry in Belfast. But this entry went into a, a big area, a area of waste ground. And I realised what had happened then. As I was driving down ahead of the cortege, I heard in downtown radio that there'd been an incident, and I turned into the car park I reached over to get a 300mm lens and when I looked up, there was nobody there. The car park was empty, except for Father Reed and the two soldiers. There was nobody else there, just the two, two bodies. And I went up to the one, the one on the right, the one nearest to me, and when I went, he seemed still to be breathing. So I started to try to give him the kiss of life. I was fortunate to capture his compassion, you know? Father Reed, the, the, these guys were beyond saving, and Father Reed was giving the last rites, and um, I, I just worked as hard as I could to record the scene, you know. And then after a while, a man came in and stood behind me, and he said, look, fellow, that man is dead. I anointed him, OK? And then I went over to anoint the man who was lying. He was about three yards away. And he was lying on his face. I went over to anoint him, and this two women came along with a coat and put it over his head and said, he was somebody's son. I felt I had done my best, you know, to save them. I, I mean, I was very shocked, and I had a feeling that, you know, I'd failed to save them. That was the bottom line, and that didn't, I didn't have, feel happy about that. It added to the tragedy, you know? Everybody would have felt maybe it was a tragedy, but it was a tragedy, and I 
But I felt even more that it was a tragedy that I had tried to stop and didn't. I don't know if there was anything more I could have done. I can remember Alec being quiet and kind of, I suppose, traumatized. It was only when I saw the papers that I realized what he had been through and uh, read what people wrote uh, about the whole. I know from the pictures and from the journalist stories what he did and uh, I mean, that's... Just seeing him and you know, kneeling beside the soldier, you know, is in a way kind of illustrated, you know, the, the deepest, um, you know, the deepest desire, you know, um, of. of community here, you know, to, you know, to bring compassion into the middle of wickedness, you know, and to bring God's compassion into the middle of wickedness. I saw in the photograph Alec himself looking straight into the camera, and I just saw a man of compassion, a man of prayer, a man of faith. It's an astonishing picture because one of the soldiers was lying uh, semi-naked in, in the shape of a cross and his body was blood splattered. And in that I saw an amazing link with the crucifixion of Christ. To me it said, here is the church doing what it must do. What others were baying for blood and vengeance. Here was the spirit of compassion and the spirit of Christ putting everything to one side to minister to our hurting, dying person. It was such an ugly image, but there was a beauty there too. And the beauty rested in the person of Father Reed. In other circumstances, people would have walked away. He didn't walk away. He kept the faith. I think the photograph is an image of an aspect of the mission of the church. And also, I mean, it was an image of the Beatitudes, the Beatitudes that Jesus speaks about. Blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they shall be, be satisfied. You know, blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they will be called children of God. Uh, those Beatitudes are, are, in a way, the weapons of the peacemaker who is following in the way of Christ. It, 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 it is, it's not an armory, it's not, it's not a weaponry, uh, you know, but it's, it, it's a quality of soul and character and mind and heart, uh, you know, that enables one to, for the long haul of, 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 of helping to uh, bring people together in peace and justice. Two soldiers were shot dead today at an IRA funeral in Belfast. They were dragged out of their car, beaten and then shot. The IRA have said they did it. Once again, news from Northern Ireland sent shockwaves around the world, and the identities of the two men Father Reed had tried to save were revealed as Corporals Derek Wood and David Howes. 
The feeling was that things were just getting out of hand. It was spiraling out of control. You had these three major violent events. You had all these deaths. You had the old rules being discarded. You had all these mysteries left about what exactly happened, what happened at Gibraltar, what happened with Michael Stone, what was he at, and what happened with the corporals. So it was a, just a period of great destabilization, of great shock. Well, you just had these serial shocks that were so horrendous in uh, human terms, uh, so shocking in visual terms, people seeing some of them uh, played out uh, on their TV, and nobody knew where that spiral was going to go. And so you did have the sense that this could go downhill uh, very, very fast, that there was a real possibility of precipice. And there was, politically at the time, there was a much bigger sense of precipice than there was of prospect. That period of history, we were getting accustomed to horrible, awful, awful things happening. There were those of us who felt all the more reason that we must try to find some way out of this. And there was to be a final twist at the end of these 14 days of darkness and despair. 14 days that had taken the lives of 12 people. Father Alec Reed still had on his person something blood-stained, something that offered hope. Under his left arm, he had a copy of that statement from Sinn Féin that he was to bring to John Hume. And those two incidents put together speak of the darkest moments but also in the darkest moment, Alec was working with hope in his heart that could bring the whole sad tragedy of the crucifixion of this community could be brought to an end in some kind of resurrection. I had this letter under my arm. It was a big brown envelope. And that's how I happened to be there, supposed to get this, to take down to John Hume. Well, I held on to it anyway. I only had to change the envelope because the blood of one of the soldiers, there was blood on the envelope. I meant I had to go back to Clonard and take it out of the... and um, get another brown envelope for it. And then I went down to John Hume down in Derry. I went down, I went, in, went to his house, you know, and he was expecting me, and I gave him this paper that I got from Sinn Féin, the Sinn Féin position on how you resolve the conflict. Despite the many and violent deaths over the past two weeks, despite the despair they had invoked across Northern Ireland, the fragile talks process had survived. The talks didn't stop between the SDLP and Sinn Féin, and certainly from Alex Reid's point of view, you know, the whole justification and rationale had actually intensified because he believed that the circumstances and the psychological impact, not least, on West Belfast was such that it made it all the more imperative that there was serious political dialogue. John Hume and I were continuing to meet, and we had moved to delegation meetings between our two parties. We were also engaging with republicanism, and with the IRA, and the hardest negotiation is always with your own side. There was a current flowing at that time. The IRA was beginning to realize the campaign had reached a stalemate situation, and I have no doubt that uh, Alec Reid, acting as an intermediary, as a, as a conduit, contributed to facilitating the developments that took place. Reid continued setting up those meetings. He was the facilitator. He was arranging all the time when and where those meetings would take place. And that was the culmination of, of that dialogue which started back uh, in, in the middle 80s.
While lives continued to be lost, this peace process struggled and persisted over the next six years, leading eventually to the IRA and loyalist ceasefires of 1994, the Good Friday Agreement of 1998, and the decommissioning of IRA weapons in 2005. Finally, for the worst of the troubles, it was at least the beginning of the end. each and every one of you, we will be blessed with peace, hope, happiness and good health. In Anam and Ahar, August in faith, August in spirit and nave, amen. Let us go now in the peace of Christ. I think with Father Reid, he sort of exuded this uh, spirituality of somebody who'd thought deeply about these things and who, who believed in peace as a concept. And very few people did in those days because Nobody had seen peace for 20, 30 years, but he kept thinking that it was possible and, and projecting it as, as possible. Would we have gone a peace process without him? Yes, but not of the particular type and certainly not at the time. Without doubt, he saved lives. Well, there's no, there's no doubt whatsoever that he saved lives. There's a, a wonderful naivety about Alec, and yet he's nobody's fool. He could be quite tenacious uh, when it came to the bit, uh, if he felt very deeply and strongly about something. As we saw on one or two occasions, one that was highly publicised, where he became very tenacious uh, when he was roused. Um, and like the rest of us, he had his vulnerable points. And when, when uh, somebody touched those, then uh, we could see another side of him. This is a man who continued with his mission to break the cycle of violence, to bring it to a close. When Reed brought the message, people knew that there was a validity and authenticity attaching to it. And that was his great strength and his great value and worth to the evolving peace process. I have always seen him as an electrician, you know? He took two wires, if I can put it this way, he took two wires where there was no current going across them. And he wrapped himself around like tape around them, held them together until the current of communication began to flow. I think when the historians look back on 30 years of conflict here and on that journey from war to peace, the story will not be told without the name of Alec Reed right in the middle of it all.